Now, for more on the sequester, joining us from Miami, we have Republican Congressman Mario Diaz Balart. He's representing Florida's 25th district. Congressman, good to have you with us here on Bloomberg. Can you outline for us what conversations you may or may not have had with the Republican leadership about the sequester up to this point? Actually, more than more than conversations, as you know, about a year ago, uh, the House passed the legislation to keep the same numbers, the same level of cuts, but to change the arbitrary nature of them. And we did it about a year ago because this is not something that just you know snuck up on us all of a sudden. We knew this was coming, uh, but we got you could hear crickets, by the way, from the White House and from the Senate uh, leadership. We passed another version of it uh, more recently, and again, no response from the White House, no response uh, from the Senate. I think it's ironic, by the way, that a, 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 the president who. Uh, you know, said publicly and uh, in more than one occasion that he would veto any changes uh, to the sequestration is now trying to blame others uh, for for having a sequestration that said that he said he would veto any changes to and again refuse to frankly deal with it. Uh, it's ironic that the first real meeting that he has with both Democratic and Republican leadership is the day before it kicks in. So you wonder why uh, we are where we are. Look, to solve these issues, it requires a lot of things. Among what it requires is some presidential leadership, and unfortunately, we've gotten very little of that. I'm not, I'm not blaming him for the sequestration. However, the fact that we have not had real negotiations, uh, is, 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 despite the fact that we in the House passed legislation on two occasions, uh, you know, you got to ask the question, where have you been, Mr. President? Congressman, can you detail for us how the sequestration will affect those people in your district, the 25th of Florida? Yeah, you know, I've seen different things. Now, you do know that the president, in particular, if, it's, if it doesn't last a long time, has some flexibility. Not if it lasts for a long time, but if it lasts for a short period of time, the administration has some flexibility to make the sequestration the least painful possible. If it lasts a long time, then we're dealing with other issues. However, I'm not quite sure what the president's goal is. is he, does he want to actually cause maximum pain to raise taxes, or does he actually want to try to solve it? And, and now, as to specifics, it all depends on what the president wants to do. You know, we saw the, uh, the, that he actually they released uh, folks in detention, uh, the ICE detention. Uh, you got to ask, you know, why do they do that? They did that before sequestration even kicked in, and now I guess nobody really knows who made that decision. It all depends on what the president wants to do. He can avoid serious pain, or he can inflict maximum pain. So I can't give you a specific answer because that's really frankly up to the president. Now, you are on various subcommittees in the House. For example, you're looking at transportation. You're also looking at financial services. What have you heard from your fellow congressmen and women about sequestration and how it will affect them? None of us like the arbitrary nature of, of the cuts. Look, when you look at the actual cut, it's 80 plus billion dollars. I mean, uh, it's not even a rounding error. So we can clearly cut less than 3% from the federal government. A federal government that has increased in size, in magnitude in the last few years. The issue is not the level of cuts, the issue is across the board. And when you do across the board, here's what happens. The efficient programs, the ones that are doing a really good job and they're efficient, they don't have a lot of fat, they get hit hard. The ones that are frankly bloated, the, the, the ones that are duplicative, those are the ones that unfortunately don't get hit as hard as they should get hit. So the problem is not the number. I think we can all live with the number. I, I, I can clearly live with the number. The problem is the arbitrary nature. That's what we were trying to avoid. That's what the president, again, has been uh, MIA. He's been missing in action for an entire year. Uh, so again, I don't think any of us, not a lot of us are concerned about the number. Um, we are concerned about the arbitrary nature. Let me give you one example. One of the subcommittees that I sit on deals with foreign aid and Department of State. You know, uh, will it eventually affect, for example, uh, the funding for the state of Israel. Well, that's something that would be devastating. It doesn't have to happen, but it's the arbitrary nature of the cuts that should worry all of us. Okay, but having said that, Congressman, you talk about the arbitrary nature of the cuts. Sequestration was something that was agreed to because Congress could not agree previously about making specific cuts. It was almost similar, I guess, to the base closure efforts so that you wouldn't have to vote on individual programs, or am I getting that wrong? 
No, you well, actually, remember, it was meant to be basically a gun to our heads, to the administration and to Congress's head, because the cuts were arbitrary. Nobody wanted that to happen. The number we agreed to, uh, but it was supposed to force us to the negotiation table. But having said About that, the fact ago, is that everybody actually voted for it, and no one thought that they would be in this position now. Now you find yourself well, in the position for something that everyone agreed to previously. I know, and I'll tell you why. Because... It, it was supposed to bring us to the negotiation table in the house look what what you know you remember that little thing about how does a law be, uh, bill become a law right house has a pass a bill senate has a pass a bill we negotiate the differences well right after this thing took place about a year ago in the house we passed legislation to keep the same level of cuts but to change the arbitrary nature of those cuts and we got absolutely no cooperation no negotiations frankly again as i said before you could hear the crickets uh, in the background the senate has yet to pass their version of of of, of changing sequestration and the White House gave a lot of speeches, the president did, but he actually said that he would veto any changes. That's why it's a little bit uh, disingenuous that now he's out there blaming others and saying that this is a horrible deal when he said that he would veto any changes to what now he claims to be a horrible bill. Well, but, but we were con supposed but to negotiate, we started negotiating. In the, but Congressman, in the interim of when you're describing this, having started the negotiations a year ago, the president didn't win re-election. Does that change any of the perspective? You know, I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. Because during uh, one of the debates, remember, he said sequestration will not take place. Before that, he had said that he would veto any changes to sequestration. But he said to the American people, sequestration would not take place. Some of us assumed that that meant, all right, we'll negotiate, which is what we were all, always supposed to do, a different set of, uh, of, of sequestration cuts, keeping the same number. Unfortunately, he's refused to do so. Look. When did the president finally meet with the, not the Republican leadership, the Democratic leadership in the Senate, the week that sequestration is kicking in? So, you know, he's been changing his, uh, Bob Woodworth uh, talked about changing the goalposts. The president has been doing more than changing the goalposts. He's been changing everything. Look, first he said, uh, first he insisted on sequestration. Then he said that he would veto any changes to the sequestration. Then he said it wouldn't happen. And then he refused to negotiate with anybody to not make it happen. Um, and, and look, it's very difficult to negotiate with somebody who refuses to frankly sit down and negotiate. I'm convinced that we can absorb less than 3% in cuts. The arbitrary nature is what we shouldn't be doing. I'm hopeful that the president will not insist on just raising taxes, doesn't think that this is an excuse to raise more taxes. If he's willing to negotiate, in the House we've passed two bills, the first one about a year ago, all that, are, that we are required now. As we all learn in sixth grade, how does a bill become a law? is for the Senate and the President to sit down and get to the table. We're waiting. We're willing to work with him. It requires a President to stop giving speeches and start showing a little bit of leadership. I want to thank you very much for joining us. Congressman Mario Diaz-Balart, he is joining us from Miami. He represents the 25th District in Florida.